Um, it may be easiest to understand altruism if we engage in some kind of wrong thinking about genes for a minute. Uh, and the reason is that what I've been what I've been trying to say over and over is that natural selection does not have a plan. It does not think. Um, organisms and genes don't plan how they're going to evolve and so forth. But um, for a minute, let's pretend that genes think. And what you ask yourself in this case is, what do genes want? What does, it, what does a gene dream of? Well, of course, they don't dream. But if a gene did have dreams and ambitions, it would be this. What a gene wants is that it wants many copies of itself in the next generation. Okay, What we're really saying in evolutionary language is alleles that cause there to be many pop copies of themselves in the next generation are going to be favored by natural selection. And so over millions of years, those are the ones you're going to see in every population. Okay, It's a lot quicker to say a gene wants something, but let's not forget that that's a fiction. What's interesting is that the gene doesn't really care which individual those copies come from. As long as there are many copies of an allele in the next generation, it's going to have an advantage in terms of natural selection. Okay, But it doesn't matter who passes on those alleles. Okay, Again, this is shorthand for something that's much more longer and complicated, but please don't forget that it is just shorthand and that alleles and genes, uh, it's very easy to slip kind of unconsciously into thinking about alleles or genes as things that plan and want. Okay, so let's take this again into the concrete example with uh, the hedgehogs. There is a particular allele in this hedgehog. Now, when this hedgehog has babies, half the time it, or half of the time when it has a baby, that particular allele is going to get passed on to that particular offspring. So alleles that in general help their organism survive and pass on those alleles will tend to do very well. Okay, But the other thing that an allele can do is that it can cause its organism to help close relatives reproduce. So if the hedgehog on the left perform some altruistic behavior towards its close relative on the right, and if the two of them share that allele that caused the organism to do that, then when that close relative reproduces, that same allele that is over here is going to end up in this offspring. Indirectly, this is reproduction. So this allele just got another copy of itself into the next generation, even though this particular physical allele did not come from this particular individual. What natural selection is going to maximize is direct reproduction plus indirect reproduction. The number of alleles that this allele manages to pass into the next generation. Um, the allele that can maximize that number wins. Um, <clears throat> what makes this look weird, if you're looking at it from the outside, is that helping relatives often means hurting yourself. And so if you don't know about indirect reproduction, it might look really counterintuitive um, that an organism is helping another but hurting itself at the same time. Okay, you may have noticed, though, out in nature that organisms don't always help their close relatives. They don't always sacrifice their lives as soon as a cousin of theirs is threatened. But sometimes they will risk their lives or sacrifice their lives for individuals that are related to them. So obviously there are some circumstances in which sacrificing something for a close relative is worth it in terms of indirect reproduction, and sometimes in which it is not worth it. Um, the amount of direct reproduction you give up isn't compensated for by an increase in indirect reproduction. A clever fellow named um, Hamilton came up with a rule, which surprisingly is called Hamilton's rule, that describes when natural selection 
will favor an allele that causes an altruistic act to happen. Uh, an altruistic act will be favored when r times b is greater than c. Okay, c is the fitness cost for the actor. So when the hedgehog passes that worm on to its relative, it's decreasing its own fitness by some amount. There's some number of offspring that that hedgehog will not be able to have because it just gave up some food. Okay, that number of offspring is C. <clears throat> Obviously, if an altruistic act doesn't cost the actor very much, that's going to tend to tip the balance in favor of organisms that perform altruistic acts. Okay, if the benefit for the recipient is large, that tips the balance in favor of the actor performing altruistic acts also. Now the fitness benefit is because the hedgehog on the left gave the one on the right a worm, how much does the fitness of the right-hand hedgehog increase? If that's a large number, then you know potentially um, the, the hedgehog on the left can get a, a lot of bang for its buck, or rather for its worm, by giving it away. And finally, um, R here is the relatedness between the actor and the recipient. In other words, uh, natural selection tends to favor altruistic acts when the actor and recipient share a lot of their genes. Let's take a look at how these uh, three conditions play out in a few situations. Um, so for example, a, a lovely uh, example of really self-sacrificing behavior occurs in that most noble of animals, the vampire bat. What vampire bats do, as you probably know, is they find sleeping animals and they, they cut their um, skin with a very, very sharp teeth and suck and lick some of their blood out of them. Um, that's how they make a living. In any given night, um, there are going to be some vampire bats that just can't find a sleeping animal to get blood from. And they risk starving to death if they don't find food for only a single night. When all the bats return to the roost after their um, evening of blood sucking, what will happen is that an empty stomached vampire bat will beg for food from another bat that has found an animal and has a nice full belly. And often what that other bat will do is it will vomit a bunch of blood into the hungry bat's mouth. See, I'm picking examples that will really stick with you after this lecture. Um, at any rate, this is um, one of these situations where it makes a lot of sense for organisms to do this because the actor is not giving up very much. They're giving up some of the blood meal they've got, but they've already got a really full stomach. Um, it's not going to cost them very much to give up a little bit of that. On the other hand, they're saving the recipient's life. So there's a big fitness benefit on the other end of the transaction. So very little cost to the actor, very large benefit to the recipient. Um, this is one of these cases where altruism is really favored. Many times, the way, way we see altruism uh, manifest itself in wild populations is you get individuals helping their close relatives raise offspring. And it turns out that this is also one of these situations where there's usually a high benefit for the recipient uh, and low cost for the actor. It looks like uh, individuals that stay home to help their relatives reproduce are incurring a big cost to themselves because they're not going out and raising their own offspring. So it looks like they're sacrificing a lot of direct reproduction. But often what's really the case is those individuals who are staying and helping their relatives are inexperienced individuals that have very little probability of successfully getting a territory, finding a mate, and rearing offspring on their own. So they're not actually giving up much of an opportunity by staying at home. By staying at home, they can really increase the number of their close relatives who survive to adulthood. So small cost, large benefit, that favors individuals that stay at home and help their relatives. Um, and finally, anytime that organisms share a lot of genes, 
they are natural selection is going to favor more altruistic acts uh, between them. And uh, this is a place where an idea that you've already heard about um, comes right on back and visits you again. It's R, the inbreeding, um, or not, sorry, the inbreeding coefficient. Um, R, the relationship between two individuals, is the same that we, as we saw, um, bah, is the same number that we saw being called F in the context of inbreeding. Um, a <clears throat> mother and an offspring, or a parent and an offspring, share half of their genes. So R is one half. Uh, full siblings share half of their genes. Um, half siblings share a quarter of their genes, and cousins share one eighth. As the relatedness coefficient as R goes down, um, actors that sacrifice something to help the recipient get less out of that sacrifice because it's less likely that the allele that causes them to make that sacrifice is actually found in that close relative. If there's an allele out there that causes an organism to save the life of its uh, full siblings, um, then every time that that happens, every time that an individual with that allele saves the life of its full sibling, there's a 50% probability that it saved another copy of itself from dying. But if you've got an allele that saves its cousins from dying, um, every time that an individual saves a cousin from dying, there's only a one in eight chance that the allele that caused that to happen is also found in that cousin whose life was saved. So um, there's basically there's a, a lower evolutionary payoff when you help distant relatives. <clears throat> the most extreme cases of altruism are what are called um, eusocial organisms. In eusocial colonies, most individuals do not reproduce. They help one or a few individuals in the colony reproduce, but they have zero direct reproduction. And the most famous example of these are honeybees, but there are also a lot of wasps and ants that do this. One of the reasons, it's not the only one, but one of the reasons for this is that the sex determination system in these insects is very unusual, and this is something uh, that we touched on briefly with a practice question in the population genetics section of the course. In uh, these organisms, in this, in the family Hymenoptera, uh, sorry, the order Hymenoptera, um, queens and workers are females, and only the drones are males. Because males only have one chromosome, that is their haploid, um, worker bees end up more closely related to their full siblings than they are to their own offspring. You can work through the math if you want to, but um, what you see here is two worker bees um, from the same colony. One of these may go off and be a new queen, and, but this is a sterile worker over here. Um, both of these individuals must receive this single um, chromosome from their haploid father. They have to receive that chromosome, and so they're automatically going to have a minimum of 50% of their genes in common. There's a 50% chance that these two individuals will inherit the same gene or the same chromosome from their mother. So they're going to be 75 percent related, not 50 percent the way it is with, say, human beings. What this means is that in honeybees and ants and wasps, um, individuals are going to be much more strongly favored when they help their siblings. And that's basically what something like a beehive is set up to do. Workers help to rear lots of siblings, new queens, that will go off and found new colonies. <clears throat>